Hey there, and welcome back to another Miraculous Ladybug Season 1 Retrospective Review. And today, we'll be taking a look at the episode Dark Cupid, which is another one of those early episodes that's stuck in my head as one of the first ones I ever saw. And it also has that iconic kiss between Ladybug and Cat Noir, but aside from that, I can't really recall much else. So I'm sort of flying blind into this one, which is kind of exciting. This season started pretty strong in my opinion, but it's quickly slipped into mediocrity. It just hasn't aged well. So let's see if this one can recapture the magic, so to speak, or if it's just more of the same. And so with all that being said, let's jump into the episode. And if you haven't watched the episode in a while, I would argue that this is probably the spot to re-watch. But anyway, we start off the episode at the school where Miss Bustier is giving a lecture on fairy tales of all things and why the prince always kisses the princess at the end of them. What kind of school lesson is this? Is this not a high school? And I mean, maybe this is a literature class and she wants them to understand the deeper themes and the context surrounding why these sorts of endings were placed in fairy tales, right? Wrong! Only love can conquer hate is the entire answer to her question. <sighs> I really hope this school doesn't require tuition fees, because otherwise, these parents are not getting their money's worth. Oh, and apparently, Love Conquers Hate is only present in 87% of fairy tales, according to resident know-it-all, Max. And like, how do you possibly know this? How? Does he have a complete list of every single fairy tale from every single culture ever? Has he seriously crunched those numbers? I'm with Miss Bustier on this one. Sit your ass down, mate. Ugh. This takes me back to my own high school days where there was always, always that one kid who loved to draw things out, trying to correct the teacher on every little thing and asking so many goddamn questions and reminding them to check the homework. Ugh. Anyway, Max is not the only person with a bad attitude in this class, however, as Adrian's writing something down, seemingly not listening at all, and when called out for this by the teacher, mockingly recites what he'd said back to her. And don't get me wrong, I don't think he's in the wrong per se, but this feels wildly out of character for his Adrian persona to be so cheeky towards a teacher of all people. Moving on though, as class ends, Adrian throws what he was writing into the trash before being confronted by Chloe, who wants him to sign a poster, although since he hates signing autographs, she tells him it's a petition to stop cruelty for hamsters who are forced to wear ugly sweaters. And yeah, he signs it. But I mean, he clearly doesn't believe that obvious lie, but he still signs it anyway. Man. In hindsight, this scene is actually sad. His dad forces him to be a celebrity. He doesn't want to be a model and do all this stuff for his father's brand, but he doesn't get a choice. And even though this kind of stuff makes him super uncomfortable, he just has to roll with it to deal with the obsessive fans. It's tragic. But as Adrian leaves, Chloe and Sabrina notice Marinette sifting through the wastebasket. And I gotta say, she took a little bit long to do that. Chloe's conversation with Adrian took like 20 seconds at least and she still hasn't managed to sift through a total of four scrunched up pieces of paper. Pure inefficiency. Plus, it's not like she was hiding from Adrian, because we see immediately after he leaves, she's completely engrossed in looking through the bin. She probably didn't even realize he was still there. What if he'd turned around to see her looking in the bin? What if she managed to find his poem, and then he turns around and sees what she's doing? I mean, honestly, even though she wasn't caught doing it, this is still deep cringe material. Chloe then decides to be an asshole, because, you know, that's who she is, and asks Marinette if she's looking for food. And then Sabrina says she's probably looking for better clothes. And man, I know Chloe's an asshole, but Sabrina is just as bad, if not worse. Cause she willingly engages in the same sort of petty bullshit and is often just as mean, or sometimes meaner than Chloe is, to try and earn her approval. Seriously, I can see why she was given the dog miraculous. Cause she really is Chloe's bitch. Moving on, we then cut to Max and Kim, who are planning Kim's Valentine's Day date with a mystery girl. And goddamn, Max really did do all the work for this, didn't he? He researched the best jewellery and then bought it for Kim to give out. And I mean, I hope Kim gave him money beforehand, or at least is going to pay him back. But anyway, Kim then begins to have doubts, but is given the confidence to go ahead with his plan by Marinette, who alongside Alia, had realised that Kim was going to attempt to woo somebody. And then, Max whips out a map on which he's marked the girl's route home so that Kim can intercept her. And Jesus, getting a bit creepy here, Maxie boy. Reminds me of that time he timed how long it took for Rose to be in the toilet. But I guess it does go to show how much of a true wingman he is. Willing to stalk somebody just to give his boy a chance. I mean, it's creepy, but it's a wholesome creepy. Also, he looks so proud as Kim runs off, like he's watched his son go off on his first date. It's quite funny. 
Anyway, Kim inspires Marinette to tell Adrian her true feelings via a response to his Valentine's Day poem, which will simply expose her as having looked through the trash to see what he wrote, but whatever floats your boat, I guess. We then move on to the Adrian Cringe Brigade, as they stare at an advertisement for a cologne that he features on. Ugh, this scene makes me sad for humanity. Isn't that girl that's hugging his poster the current kids' channel weather girl in canon? What the hell's up with this? She was on TV when she got a position. It seemed to be a big deal. There was even a red carpet. And now here she is, reduced to hugging a poster. Same with the other weather girl, just gushing. And then they see that Chloe has a signed poster declaring her Adrian's true love, and they all burst into tears. And this scene is actually quite funny, especially when Chloe orders them to cry more and moves the poster closer to one girl's face to get a better reaction. But it's also deeply sad and pathetic. Are people actually like this around handsome slash beautiful celebrities? Are they truly this pathetic? Ugh. We then cut to Marinette's room, where she's trying to write Adrian a love letter response and failing, declaring that she sounds like a total Dorcasaurus, only to be told by Tiki that she is cringe for using words like Dorcasaurus. And I miss this, Tiki. Spitting facts. Sassing Marinette, laughing at her pain. Hell, she even pinched her early in the episode and then just giggled. She's an interdimensional thousand-year-old being. It makes sense that she'd have strong opinions and not just sit back and let this teenage girl sit in the driver's seat of their friendship. I honestly think they mallet her out way too much in later seasons as Marinette gained confidence, and they turned her into way too much of a yes-man or into the classic, Oh, I don't know about this one, Marinette, voice of dissent. A lot of her personality dropped away, and it's a big-time shame. Alia then turns up with a card shaped like a love heart, and they act like this is some crazy, epic, rare card, but like, surely she just bought this at a supermarket or a corner store? It really isn't that impressive, girls, come on. But whatever, she writes the thing, a ladybug walks across the card, which Alia says is a symbol of love and devotion, using her blog as a reference, before we cut to Adrian, who is also scrolling on the blog, pining over ladybug across four different monitors. And Plague, much like Tiki, tells him he is cringe and then mocks him about the poem. Seriously, what's up with the sass that is dripping off these Kwamis today? I'm loving it. We then move on to Kim, and it turns out his mystery girl is Chloe. And as soon as you see that shit, you just know that this is the worst idea of all time, and somebody should have talked him out of this. What a fool. Oh. Anyway, of course, it all goes wrong. He stutters, he kneels down in a puddle, and what are you doing kneeling down to ask someone to be your valentine? He gets splashed by a passing bike, and then a packet of chips hits him in the face. Yeah, there's no recovering from this. Oh, and then Chloe takes a photo and shares it with everybody in her contacts list. And then he starts crying on the bridge. Ugh. Time to move schools, move house, just just leave Paris, mate. Nothing's left for you here now. Hawkmoth then gets in on the action, laughing about how delusional Kim was to think he had a chance as he sends out his Akuma. And he turns Kim into Dark Cupid, who then begins to rampage through Paris, making people into assholes. And I'd say the best ones are the woman who throws her Valentine's Day cake into the river, and the man who starts smashing his bouquet of flowers, saying, Stupid flowers? Yeah. It's stupid, but the flower guy did make me laugh quite hard. Anyway, Marinette and Alia then go out to mail her Valentine to Adrian, although it has no address on the front, so how the hell will the postal service even know? Are there special Adrian fan mail letterboxes because he's so popular in this world? They then get the message from Chloe and see Kim's heartbreak, before Ali equips that she hopes that Adrian doesn't do the same thing to Marinette, which of course sets her off into a crisis. Seriously, this banter. Where did it all go in later seasons? Alia is then attacked by Dark Cupid, which makes her mean. And then Marinette transforms, once again, pretty much in broad daylight. Hiding behind a park bench is not incognito. People can still see through the fence. Meanwhile, as Ladybug confronts Dark Cupid and tells him not to be an incel, we also learn that Chloe's ordered a gold-plated photo frame. And I mean, how rich is she? Like, I did a quick search, and I found 18 karat gold frames for thousands of dollars. And those were just small-sized photo frames, not a full portrait. God damn! And she just ordered this off the cuff, so it was probably more expensive. <sighs> rich people. Anyway, after a quick battle between Cupid and Ladybug, Cat Noir arrives and tries to confess his love, and I mean, time and a place, man. And at the same time, Hawkmoth thinks that threatening Dark Cupid is the best way to make him fight harder to get the Miraculous. And I mean, come on again. 
Does stupidity run in this family? Couple of boneheads. And speaking of boneheads, instead of taking Cat Noir's Miraculous after he gets brainwashed, Hawkmoth orders Dark Cupid to work with him to steal Ladybugs. I mean, surely they could have tricked him into just giving up his Miraculous, you know, by saying, hey, I can defeat Ladybug, but you have to give me your Miraculous first. I feel like this power would have warped his mind so that no price is too little to hurt Ladybug, so he would probably agree with this. Why wouldn't you at least check? Because even if he says no, there's always a plan B. Just premium stupidity and premium plot armor. As per usual. Oh, and of course, Ladybug to the rescue, and Cat Noir is once again mind controlled and a liability. <laughs> yeah. Seems like this has always been a running theme, I guess. We then have a very brief fight between Ladybug and Cat Noir, until she realizes that to turn him back, she needs to kiss him against his will and his consent. But you know, none of these characters have healthy boundaries at all, so what do you know? The sex ed teacher at their school needs to be fired. Meanwhile, Dark Cupid chases Chloe until she falls through a garden stall and gets covered in dirt and grime, and turns Sabrina with one of his arrows, which of course leads to Sabrina taking a photo of her and sending it to everybody in her contacts. And honestly, this is well deserved. I'm not a big fan of bullying, but karmic justice is my exception to this rule. She got what she deserved. Back to the battle, however, Dark Cupid and Cat Noir reunite to face off with Ladybug, who uses her lucky charm to get a candy apple slash toffee apple. And I gotta say, this doesn't look like a candy apple to me. An apple? Apples are round, right? That thing is not thick enough to have an apple inside it. It's nearly flat. Unless it has like half an apple inside, but who the hell would want that? I even googled love heart candy apples and I got nothing that even resembles this thing at all. False advertising much? Anyway, she uses it to stick his fingers together. <sighs> yeah, because that would work and then kisses Cat Noir and saves the day single-handedly by throwing Cat Noir at Dark Cupid whilst Cataclysm's still active. Deakumatize, fix everything, yada yada. She's the hero, hooray! Although I gotta say, when everything gets reversed, doesn't all the damage they do get reversed too? So why the hell is Sabrina's graffiti on the poster still there? Eh, whatever. Oh, and Marinette also forgot to sign her card, so Adrian thinks it's from Ladybug. And whilst it is actually from her, he is also a bit delusional to think so, without any sort of proof beyond a ladybug beetle walking across it at the perfect moment. Also, surely this would suggest, if he thinks this, that she must be in his class. Because who else would have checked the bin, unless ladybug is the cleaner? Oh, and we finish with Gabe screaming into the abyss because he hates Valentine's Day. And is this the first one without his wife, you reckon? Because if so, that's sad. No wonder he was having so much fun ruining everybody's day. And so, that's the end of the episode. And honestly, Whilst it wasn't really all that notable, I think this episode was fairly decent. I laughed a few times, and it aged better than some of the other episodes. And it had really good characterization for the Kwamis in it. And so, with all that being said, that's the end of the review. And I would like to say that these were just my opinions, and now I'd like to hear yours. What do you think of the episode? Like it? Hate it? I'm curious for your thoughts, so make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and let me know.